Good morning, um, and thank you very much for the invitation to uh, talk about peripheral T cell lymphomas and the new treatments that are um, available at the moment. And I want to mention that 2018 was a good year for, for T cell lymphomas. So uh, T cell lymphomas, as you know, arise from uh, mature T cells that have already sort of gone through the thymus and then populate the lymphoid organs. Um, they are different from uh, lymphoblastic uh, lymphomas that are sort of not as mature in terms of their origin of T cells. And by the WHO 2016 classification, based on histochemical and uh, cytogenetic as well as the clinical features, there are about 25 different subtypes of PTCL or peripheral T cell lymphomas, also known as mature T cell lymphomas. Um, and they include the NK T cell lymphomas as well arising from NK cells. And I just wanted to point out um, what's just come up uh, literally in January of 2019. What the field is really headed towards whole genome sequencing, mutational analysis, and I think what's going to come down the pipeline is going to be classification that may differ from what we see here and based more on um, mutational and transcriptional analysis. As, as you can see, this study highlights the different clustering that have been seen in different subtypes of, or major, three major subtypes of PTCL, angiomyoblastic T cell lymphoma, ALK, um, ALCL, and PTCL NOS, clustering differently in terms of their genomic uh, expression. There's also clustering differences based on sex. And then, of course, mutations. And I'll talk a little bit about these common mutations that are now starting to arise or are being recognized in these different subtypes of PTCL that can help us. Um, they, you know, they seem to cluster, like the, hypo, uh, the epigenetic mutations, sorry, seem to cluster more uh, in the angiomyoblastic T cell lymphoma. Um, and some of this can help be helpful in diagnosis as well as prognosis. And I'll show you some of that data. So I think that's where the future is going. So this, day, this uh, talk is going to focus on um, some interesting, uh, what I decided to pick was um, what I call the complete registry data, which is basically a report card on the treatment of PTCL in North America, in the U.S. particularly. This is a registry that was established in 2010 with the support of Spectrum Pharmaceutical and basically looked at institutions that treat PTCL and collected um, information on treatment patterns and what was, it wasn't a therapeutic registry, just an informational one. And it, it has given us some, some useful information in the last uh, few years when the, the data has been published, and I'll show you some of that. I call that our report card on the treatment of PTCL. I will talk a little bit about the pathogenesis and then talk about treatment, particularly the Echelon 2 uh, data that was mentioned in the first question, uh, and talk about some of the new targets. So this is the complete registry. It was a cohort of about 499 patients that started. Uh, in the registry, and then based on, they had to be enrolled within the first 30 days of their uh, diagnosis, and then there were some um, issues with diagnos uh, with uh, in terms of their pathology and so on, and in the end, um, about 119 patients were followed um, or survived for about two years, and it led to some interesting information. So the first question came up was, what are the most common treatment, upfront treatments for patients with PTCL in the United States? And there's always, there's no standard of care, but most people will use a CHOP-based regimen. But previous to this, our data or our information was coming from the International T-Cell Lymphoma Project, where it had been shown that the anthracycline use did not seem to affect the outcome of T-cell lymphomas. And this registry actually seems to, or, or this data seems to contradict that. At least, first of all, the first information is that anthracycline-containing regimens are certainly a big chunk of the upfront treatment, uh, whether they're on a trial or not. And it seems to be that the complete responses are higher when you use anthracycline as the upfront therapy. Now, if that's going to improve outcomes and survival is unclear, but that's certainly the practice pattern. Um, and other regimens were used in different, uh, different percentages. If you look at outcomes, overall outcomes of these patients, uh, it seems like overall survival, um, it looking at about five years, the best survival seems to be with anaplastic large cell lymphoma. That seems to have the best outcome in any PTCL study. Everything else, and this is looking at, again, the most common subtypes, the angiomyoblastic uh, and um, PTCL NOS subtypes. Five-year survival is about 40%. If you look at IPI status, and this is not something we use very often in PTCL because most patients we feel present with a very high advanced stage and have a high IPI, but if they have early stage disease, they tend to do a little bit better. Um, 
And again, this is dividing them by IPI 0 to 1, and then, then this is 3 and 4. So it seems to be that if you have early stage disease, and you, can, you may have better outcomes. And then this is the differences between anthracycline versus non-anthracycline-containing treatments in terms of survival. Okay. So the other question that comes up, uh, and it's recommended that patients who uh, achieve a remission with upfront therapy, at least with the nodal subtypes, be considered for an autologous stem cell transplant for consolidation. And that's a debatable point. We don't have randomized data to support that, but that is certainly the recommendation from the NCCN guidelines. And most, uh, at least in academic centers, they consider transplant to be the next step um, for nodal disease. Uh, however, the interesting thing about the complete registry was that there were 119 patients who had achieved a complete remission at the end of the first treatment, out of which only 36 underwent transplant. The other 83 were not transplanted, and that was mostly physician choice. So we are not transplanting it in the community. We're not really transplanting a lot of these patients for various reasons. But it seemed to, this is probably the only study where they've actually looked at transplant versus non-transplant outcomes, um, not directly against this. This was not a therapeutic study, but it looks like transplant seems to do better. Um, so this is patients, again, anaplastic large cell lymphoma, always better than non-anaplastic non histology. But if you look at median overall survival, if the patients had had a transplant, their median overall survival was not reached at 2.8 years of median follow-up. But if they hadn't had transplant, their median overall survival was less, and progression-free survival seemed to be better with an upfront transplant. So again, this is for nodal histologies. Um, moving on, uh, for relapse refractory disease, I just want to point out these are the approved agents, currently FDA-approved agents in the United States and another part of the world for relapse refractory PTCL, and prolotrexate, romid, sorry, Prolotrexate, romidepsin, bolinostat, and brentuximab are approved in the U.S. between 2009 and 2014. This is when the complete registry was ongoing. BV was not available at that point, except on trials. Overall response rates of most of these agents are about 26%. CR rates are low, 11 to 15%. So we're not really doing great with single agent um, uh, treatments or, or even approved treatments for for PTCL, except for brentuximab, which has a very high response rate in anaplastic large cell lymphoma, and also works in non-ALCL um, histologies if there's CD30 expression, with a decent duration of response, 13.2 months. But the duration of response, even with single agents, is actually considerable. You can probably get them to transplant if that's the intention, um, or palliate them. The other options that come up is, and again, this is always a debate when, when a patient relapses, should we do prolotrexate or should we do ICE or DHAP, even with transplant eligible patients, and the NCCN guideline is not helpful because it just list, lists all the, all the different agents alphabetically. But through the complete registry, um, we have a little bit more information. So this is, these are the uh, reported response rates for ICE and ESHAP in uh, PTCL relapse rates, high response rate, but short duration of responses. So uh, even with bendamustine, the response rates are about 50%, but duration of response is really short. So uh, crizotinib, which is, only, which is an ALK-directed uh, therapy, has a very high response rate if you have ALK-positive ALCL relapse, but that's a very rare situation. The reason I showed you this data is because what came out of COMPLETE was actually quite interesting. So again, in this case, we had about 57 patients in the registry that relapsed, and depending on the physician choice, they got either a single agent, um, 31 patients got single agents, some of them were approved, and 26 got combination chemotherapy, um, IACE or DHAP or GEM-based, and the response rates were higher in patients who got the single agent. So 57 patients treated. 26, as I mentioned, with combination chemotherapy. At a median follow-up of two years, there was increased CR rate with single versus combination, 41% versus 19%. Survival seemed to be a little bit better as well with the single agent, the, including the approved agents. Uh, Progression-free survival was 11.2 months versus 6.7 months, and more patients got to transplant with the single agent. So at least the FDA-approved therapies seem to be a little bit better than uh, the general therapies for lymphoma, and maybe the, the differences in biology between B and T cell lymphomas are really at work here, and we should really be focusing on T cell directed uh, or, or T cell um, directed treatment options in terms of trying to improve our responses. So, uh, again, this is the same data shown as a graphic form. <clears throat> 
So what's next? Um, go back to basics, I guess. We're not doing great in the treatment of T-cell lymphomas. We continue to lose these patients. So I just wanted to mention briefly about pathogenesis of PTCL, what we're, under, we're trying to now get more information about this, but it seems like there's three different components to pathogenesis of PTCL. There's intrinsic components that seem to be dysfunctional, T-cell receptor signaling pathways, um, JAK-STAT pathways, the PI3 kinase pathways, and, and a lot of epigenetic alterations because epigenetic agents seem to be active in PTCL. But the tumors don't arise themselves. The microenvironment, at least in T-cell lymphoma, seems to be very important, including cutaneous T-cell lymphomas. And there seems to be evidence that there is uh, um, decreased immun tumor immunogenicity and environmental signaling that, and, and also the interactions with the non-neoplastic T-cells that seem to be important in the uh, pathogenesis of PTCL and probably would be, need to be targeted if you want to have a complete uh, anti-cancer therapy for this uh, subtype. And then, of course, there are a few of these that are virally driven. There are EBV-driven viruses and HTLV-1-driven ATLL, which we don't see a lot of in, in, in Los Angeles, but it's common in the Caribbean and where we have a lot of migrant populations from those areas. Uh, this is what we are starting to see in the literature in terms of molecularly defined entities of PTCL. Using gene expression profiling, you can actually subtype the different uh, subtypes of PTCL. Sorry. Go back here. Um, and this is important diagnostically. These are subtypes. And it seems like the NK T cell lymphomas tend to cluster a lot with the gamma delta T cell lymphomas that are very aggressive. Um, but the important thing that came out of this study was um, that you can actually prognosticate based on gene expression profiling like, like you do for B cell lymph or DLBCLs now. So GATA3 and TRBX21 um, are two sets of gene expression profiling patterns that seem to uh, uh, help in prognosis of PTCL NOS. Uh, so if you have GATA3 expression, the patients have a better prognosis versus the TRBX2-1 uh, expression, which seems to have a poor prognosis. And this may have to be, uh, may have to do with how, uh, you know, what, what uh, the, 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 these two molecules are master regulators of TH1 and TH2 subtypes of T cells. And that may be one of the reasons they have different prognosis. And you can actually look at GATA3 by immunohistochemistry. Moving on, um, ALCL, which is another interesting uh, tumor um, subtype, there's always the ALK positive and ALK negative, and we know that they have differences in survival. If it was ALK positive, the patients tend to do beautifully. They have a good response to CHOP and can be cured without even a transplant, whereas ALK negatives have a less favorable outcome. But if you look at DUSP22 and TP63 expression, uh, and this can be looked at by mutational analysis, and a lot of the labs will do that for you. DUSP22 mutated patients in ALK-negative alloplastic large cell lymphoma have a similar prognosis as ALK-positive. So um, if you have ALK-positive, you're ALK-negative and DUSP222 positive, you have a good prognosis. If you're P63 mutated, that's a bad sign. Those patients do poorly. And if you're triple negative, ALK negative, DUSP22 negative, and P63 negative, you have an intermediate prognosis. And so sometimes in terms of whether to transplant or not to transplant, the presence of DUSP22 mutation is clinically very helpful. Uh, NK T cell lymphomas, again, I'm not gonna go through this. I don't wanna run out of time. I do wanna talk about treatments. So these are some of the potential therapeutic targets for PTCL. Again, this is coming out of uh, what we are starting to understand about the pathogenesis of T cell lymphomas. So I wanna move on to treatments. Um, so the first, um, I think the star so far is the CD30 targeted therapy. Um, this is again coming out of the fact that C there are tumors that express CD30 and using brintuximab vedotin, which is a uh, CD30 targeted and, uh, ADC. Um, it is approved for the treatment of Hodgkin's lymphoma, but in the T cell world, it is approved for now approved for the upfront treatment of PTCL in combination with CHP chemotherapy, and I'll show you that data through Echelon 2. Um, it's approved for relapsed ALCL. This became, um, this was before. Uh, it was 2011 before this upfront indication, and it's also approved for the treatment of CD30 expressing cutaneous T cell lymphomas. Okay. So this is Echelon 2. This is the first randomized trial in the upfront setting for PTCL, and it is also the only trial that has shown an improvement in survival. So we are all very excited about it. Um, this was a large study. It was of over 400 patients, uh, which is rare for T cell lymphomas, but it was an excellent um, 
uh, well, you know, it came out of good collaborations between centers. The key inclusion criteria were pa you patients had to have CD30 expression up to 10% was the cutoff point. Uh, all subtypes were included, listed here, good performance status, and no peripheral neuropathy uh, beyond grade two because brintuximab causes uh, neuropathy. Patients received either at Cedris, or which, which, which is a commercial name for brintuximavidotin, plus a CHP, uh, which is the CHOP without the vincristine. The, uh, the vincristine was dropped because of neuropathy. And it was a one-to-one -one randomization with CHOP. And this was a blinded study. So as treating physicians, we did not know which patient was going to go on which arm. There were the usual three-week uh, cycles, uh, six to eight cycles. And the primary endpoint was progression-free survival. And there were some interesting uh, secondary points, including overall survival and then follow-up. This study required to have, uh, at least 75% of patients had to have ALK-negative ALCL by requirement. This was an, a requirement from the European um, uh, agency, the European FDA, uh, because they, that was a mandate of the study. So a lot of the patients were ALCL, and there's a concern that that may have biased the study, but it was blinded. So that, uh, I think the data is still pretty valid. So in terms of treatment, uh, the patient characteristics, they were fairly well balanced between the two arms. Um, this is the outcome. The progression-free survival was improved uh, in the A plus CHP arm, 29% reduction in risk of progression-free uh, progression events, 48.2 uh, versus 20.2 months. So this was one of the questions that we talked about earlier. Um, it improved overall survival, 42 months with A plus CHP arm. Uh, versus CHOP with a 34% reduction in the risk of death. So again, this is the only study that has actually shown improvement in survival with just upfront therapy, and this does not address the question of transplant. Uh, and there were higher CR rates with the A plus CHP arm versus CHOP, 68% versus 56%. And adverse events were pretty comparable in the two arms. So except for maybe a little bit more neuropathy, there were really no significant issues. There were some dose reductions or dose delays in the in the dosing of BV um, as per guidelines. So it, th this is actually what's led to the actual approval of uh, AC, a, BV plus CHP in the upfront setting. Now this is an interesting study that actually was before the study I just mentioned, the Echelon 2. This was the original phase one study, came out of MD Anderson, that looked at um, six cycles of B, uh, it, it was bentuximab plus CHP, followed by 10 cycles of BV alone as maintenance, no transplant. And this is, sorry. This is the four-year follow-up. As you can see, this is patients who did not receive transplant. So there is some data to support that maybe instead of transplant, a maintenance type of regimen, at least in CD30 expressing uh, tumors, may be a reasonable option, though we don't have long-term data to support that. So uh, CD30 expressing CARs are also coming down the line. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because they're really being tested in Hodgkin's disease, but it is an important target. Moving on to other targets, I want to talk a little bit about epigenetic therapy. So we know that romidepsin and belinostat are approved. Those are uh, uh, they are HDAC inhibitors. But the use of 5 as cytidine as a hypomethylating agent uh, has been looked at in PTCL and uh, seems to be very effective, at least in patients with angiomyoblastic T-cell lymphoma that express a TET2 mutation. So going back to the mutational analysis, patients who express this uh, a TET2 mutation that affects the epigenetic pathway uh, seem to have a high response rate to epigenetic agents. And in combination with, you can actually combine them with the uh, uh, HDAC inhibitors as well. And that trial was presented at ASH, uh, the combination of 5 azacytidine with uh, romidepsin. Again, the responses in TET2 expressing AITL patients were pretty sustained. So that's, uh, that's another possible targeted agent that's coming down the, uh, you know, at least in patients with those specific mutations, this could be a possibility. CD25 is another interesting target. This is the alpha subunit of, of the IL-2 receptor. Uh, Anti-25-directed antibody therapies have been used um, in various indications and include basiliximab and dacluzumab. We use them in graft-versus-host disease treatments. But they can be combined with various isotopes. Uh, they can be combined with bismuth or yttrium or with uh, dip, uh, toxins like diphtheria toxin or cytotoxic agents. So this I wanted to talk to you about this ADC301, which is similar to brintuximab vidotin, except it targets CD25, and it's combined with a PBD molecule, which is currently in trials for PTCL with very impressive, over 50 to 60% response rates in the first phase of the study. 
So this is currently in clinical trials and they are hoping for registration um, directed therapies. At City of Hope, we have a yttrium labeled basiliximab antibody that we are actually using um, as part of um, a clinical trial for uh, uh, autologous transplants in, in PTCL. BEAM is the standard conditioning regimen for autologous stem cell transplants, but we uh, give them a dose of uh, yttrium labeled basiliximab prior to the, uh, give, getting chemotherapy as targeted radiation. Um, and this is an ongoing phase one study where we've actually accrued about 15 patients and there have been no safety concerns so far. Um, CCR4 is another molecule that's expressed on PTCL. It is targeted by an antibody called mogamulizumab, uh, currently approved in Japan for the treatment of ATLL as well as PTCL that expresses CCR4. Uh, the trials for PTCL are currently undergoing in the uh, in, uh, in United States, but it is already approved for the treatment of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, mycosis fungoides, and Cesare syndrome in the US based on the results of this Maverick trial which was a randomized trial of megamalizumab versus varenostat in patients with MF and Cesare syndrome, and then led to the approval of this agent for, for this indication. Um, I think the next indication will probably be for ATLL because it has a high expression of CCR4, and then we are looking at combinations with lenalidomide and other agents in PTCL. So this is a list of some of the novel single agents currently in trials for PTCL. Um, Alicertib is an Aurora A kinase inhibitor. It was studied in PTCL as a randomized trial with gemcitabine, romidepsin, and prolotrexate. Single agent activity was not great, and this was abandoned as a single agent, but in combinations, it's being looked at again. Crozotinib, I mentioned again, is an ALK inhibitor, 100% response rate in ALK positive ALCL. So in coming to, coming to the PI3 kinase inhibitor story, PI3 kinase is another, tar another targeted um, pathway in PTCL, and there are two agents currently in trials, duvalisib and tenalisib. Um, the initial response rates are about 50 to 56 percent. Um, phase two studies uh, are undergoing right now, including registration study for duvalisib, uh, and there are some, some CRs seen in this, so hopefully this will be another important agent, and it's also in, in trials in combination with romidepsin and other uh, targeted T-cell agents. JAK-STAT pathways are another um, pathways that are dysregulated in a lot of the subtypes of PTCL, including NK T-cell lymphomas, and ruxolitinib and serdulitinib are the two agents currently in trials for this. So lots of new things coming down the pipeline. Just like myeloma, we're starting to look at doublets and triplets, prolotrexate and romidepsin. Um, and so these are just sort of listed here, but you can see response rates of the doublets and um, triplets are starting to rise. So that's what we need to do. We need to go above that 30% response rate to really get more patients cured. Um, finally, going, getting into immunotherapy, I'm just going to mention a few words. So the PD-1 inhibitors for PTCL have not really panned out so far. They're still in trials, but we haven't really made a lot of progress there in terms, and then in case, in fact, there are some concerns about hyperprogression because PD-1 may actually drive the T cell, uh, the PD-1 inhibition may drive T cell growth. But CD47 expressed on macrophages um, is another target, and it's shown to be effective in T-cell lymphomas. It seems to interact with the SERP1 uh, molecule expressed on the macrophage. The CD47 is expressed on the tumor. This sends a do not eat me signal, so the, tum the, the tumor survives. If you block it with an antibody, the macrophages can then destroy the tumor. And this uh, CD47 blockade uh, in combination with rituximab has been very efficacious in B-cell lymphomas and is now being looked at in T-cell lymphomas. The intertumoral injection in cutaneous T-cell lymphomas is very impressive. So we're working on that antibody. PD-1 inhibitors for PTCL were not very effective, but for NK T-cell lymphomas have shown some dramatic responses um, in patients particularly in Asia, both nivolumab and, and uh, pembrolizumab, and this is now part of the NCCN guidelines for the relapsed uh, NK T cell lymphoma. Um, then you can look target, there are other ways of targeting um, or providing immunotherapy targeted uh, uh, CTLs targeting EBV viral proteins for NK T cell lymphoma are also being used. Um, CD38 is another interesting molecule expressed in a lot of NKT cell lymphomas, and we're looking at possibly daratumumab to target this trial as being planned. Hopefully, this will be in, in trials in the next few months. Um, CAR T cells for T cell lymphoma have not really been there. We don't have anything very effective at the moment, except for possibly the CD30 
There have been a couple of challenges. We don't have a good target. So CD30 is one, and then CCR4 is being looked at. The second problem is fratricide. So T cells, after they're given the CAR T cells, they have to expand in the host, and the normal T cells would kind of eat those up if they were directed against them. So to get around that, there are a couple of clever ways. Um, they're looking at a uh, TCR receptor. Um, this constant region can have two isoforms, and, and because of uh, the, no, uh, the clonal nature of T-cell lymphomas, either one or the other isoform will be, will be present in the tumor, so you can target that with a specific CAR T-cell and save the other normal T-cells. So that's possibly going to go into clinical trials later. Um, this is the NCCN guideline algorithm for T-cell lymphomas. I just wanted to mention that we have now have the CHP plus BV as a first-line therapy as well in the NCCN guidelines. And this is my dream um, sort of plan for T-cell lymphoma eventually, that we should go away from all this chemotherapy base and really look at the patient's tumor and look at their um, mutational analysis and see what's, what's, what's being represented in that tumor, look at the microenvironment, and then target the therapy based on what we find, either CD30-directed therapy, that's already been shown, and then you have these other possible targets, the epigenetics, uh, you know, the IDH1 or BCL2 targets, JAK stats, immunotherapy, and then that's how we're going to get to better remission rates and CRs and possibly cures. And these are our future directions. We need to collaborate. These are rare diseases. So we have a T-cell consortium, a couple of them throughout the country, that, that allows us to do trials. There's a great need for tissue banking and collaboration for um, looking at patients' tumors and peripheral blood. Um, look at these genetic you know, mutational analysis and come up with treatment uh, with, with sort of um, uh, pathways that we can target. Um, we need to improve the outcomes of our transplant and then, of course, develop more cellular therapies, just like other diseases. And I want to thank you. I think I went over, and I apologize for that. Um, this is our celebration of life at City of Hope. So with this, I will end my talk. And I guess questions we're going to do later. We'll do